Meta narrative in progress. Here it is, the month of May in the year 2020. And it appears that some really bizarre events are unfolding in the world drama. There is some deranged behavior going on among the populations in countries all around the world. Now, I don't know if it would be possible to have a sober and rational conversation lasting two minutes with anyone in that population. I really don't know. I'd have to go out and test the atmosphere. But if I had the opportunity to encounter a few people on the street who would stand close enough to me to have an amiable and comfortable moment of conversation, I would start with this question. Do you believe that you are living in a Soviet totalitarian nightmare? Now, I have no idea what the response would be, but suppose it would be, well, no. No, I'm not living in a Soviet system. I'm living in a free Western democracy or something like that. And were the answer to be no, then I would come back with another question. Well, if you're not living in a Soviet totalitarian nightmare, then why are you behaving as if you are? Are you just pretending to be in one for the fun of it, just to get a sense of what it feels like? I often wonder if it's possible to have a sane conversation with anyone in the world today. And yet there may be some indications of emergent sanity, possibly. For instance, regarding the subject of this talk, well, I've heard that there are some human individuals here and there, principally in Europe, I would guess, which is where I happen to find myself, who are pondering and discussing the issue of a meta-narrative. Now, I can't say who they are or where, and none of them, if such do exist, has approached me on that topic. So I'm going to just put it lightly and casually and say there's a rumor going around that some people in the Western Euro-American culture are seeking a meta-narrative. Perhaps seeking is too strong a word. Let's say they're sensing the need for a meta-narrative. They're perhaps considering and pondering if there might be a meta-narrative and more specifically, if there might be a meta narrative that is specific to the white races. One term I've heard used is foundation myth. Is there a foundation myth 
for the white races. Well, that's one of the various ways that you could paraphrase the question about the lack of a meta narrative. So the rumor appears to indicate, as far as I can make out, that the absence of that particular meta narrative is coming to the attention of some people. So, it looks like it's a good moment for me to address that topic. Now, on the way to any discussion of the meta narrative, I deem it necessary to take a bit of a stroll through a rather swampy, pestilent area where, if you're not careful, you might find yourself wandering about on the quest for a meta narrative. I'm speaking here of the zone of those intellectuals, scholars, psychiatrists, psychologists, semioticians, semioticians, that is to say, masters of semiotics, and so forth and so on, who have announced the absolute death, not only of the narrative, but of the meta narrative. So I'm taking this odd little tactic of addressing the argument that would affirm that there is no point in looking for a meta narrative, no point in longing for a meta narrative, because in the era of postmodernism and deconstructivism, it's become clear that that's impossible and implausible and worthless. So, most of that argument comes out of the French school, and so I deem it fitting to offer a few remarks about the French school. That would be a classroom of bad boys, such as Jacques Lecon, not Lecon, but close to it, Michel Foucault, Orlan Bart, Jacques Derrida, and you could throw in a woman feminist post modernist deconstructionist Julia Kristeva dated her once dismal experience I wouldn't recommend it now I can't say explicitly or specifically which one of these characters uh, came out and flat out denied that it was possible anymore for it was possible anymore to entertain the idea of a meta narrative much less be involved in one but basically in one way or another they all contributed to a massive argument that the meta narrative is no more and is not to be sought nor longed for I'm not going to get into the grungy and gruesome particulars of their arguments. And I won't hide the fact that I have total contempt for the whole bunch of them. To me, the French school, nothing more than a raggle-taggle band 
of I won't call them rebel intellectuals, that glorifies them too much. I just call them naughty little schoolboys. And the main motivation behind their rebellious attitude in the cases of some more than others was to... uh, get the attention of the teacher so that they could be taken into the back room for a little scolding and a spanky-poo and whatever else might come along with it. And that's about all you need to know about them, really. I would say, for Jacques Lacan, that he did say one thing that was absolutely brilliant. And there is one sentence out of his entire mass of work that's worth knowing and quoting. And I do quote, the unconscious is structured like a language. But apart from that, I really don't care to spend five seconds of my precious time in any kind of critique of these dudes. They themselves were highly critical in their theories, critical to the degree or to the extent of nihilism. And they used uh, such intellectual powers as they had to destroy the intellectual integrity of the whole human race, as far as I can see. Now, if they were around today, and I was stuck in a symposium where I had to argue with them, I wouldn't argue. I would simply rest my case on one sentence to say that there is no meta-narrative is just another way to assert a narrative. And that's my argument. So what they propounded, although they were in denial against their own expression, was the narrative of the non-narrative, or the narrative of the missing narrative. So finally, in dragging my sorry ass out of that swamp, there are probably two other brain-fried Frenchies that deserve some mention. They don't exactly fall into the school of these others, certainly not, but they're peripheral figures and they've commanded considerable degree of attention. Certainly, Jean Baudrillard is well known by his association with the Matrix trilogy of films. As a matter of fact, there are some instructive points in Baudrillard when he talks about simulacra and simulation, simulacra and simulacrum. So when he talks about the crumb trail, when he takes you down the crumb trail of simulation, there are numerous points in which his exposition resonates with the Gnostic instruction on simulation, or as it goes in the Coptic word, Hal, H-A-L, virtual reality, simulation. Well, the Gnostics, those ancient seers and leaders of the mystery schools, seem to have had a pretty good fix on that subject. And as a matter of fact, you can find in some of the Gnostic writings, linked closely with the Orphic school, to which G.R.S. Mead gave particular attention, 
you can find a model of the matrix, which actually, which they actually expressed, described, in terms of a multi-level video game. The journey through the planetary spheres. A multi-level video game where you meet trolls called archons at each level and you are tested by the troll and you have to know a password, a magic formula in order to get by that troll to the next level. And that conception, that construction coming exclusively out of the Gnostic schools was modeled closely on the astronomical trope of the planetary spheres. That construction is the original or oldest known version of, quote, the matrix, end quote. But what the Gnostics understood by the matrix was not the physical world in which we live, the natural habitat, considered as a simulation or considered as some kind of holographic projection based in some computer software operating in some other dimension. No, no, and no again. The Gnostics distinguished carefully, again in the Coptic idiom, between what they called cause, K-A-Z, and cosmos. Now, cosmos is a Greek word which means, or meant in the Gnostic idiom, a construction, something that is made deliberately for a particular purpose. You could say a designed habitat. And yet they distinguished that concept from cos, which is the Coptic word based on Gaia or gay, the Greek word, meaning earth. So there's the earth and there's the cosmos, and they're not the same. Why not? Well, that's where the brilliant Gnostic insight about simulation comes into play. The cosmos is an artificially designed simulation, whereas cause or Gaia is the real natural world, which is not a simulation. So you see there's a deep Gnostic nuance contained in the difference between those two words, cause and cosmos. The Gnostics most certainly did not consider that the natural world, the habitat of the planet Earth, was a dark prison-like matrix. Not at all. The matrix was the artificial world of the archons. It was a deliberate trap for the human mind and a dead end. So I haven't read Baudrillard, but I suspect that he might have been on to those Gnostic insights and concepts in one way or another. Closing off this gruesome topic, uh, it would be remiss not to mention someone, another Frenchie, whom I used to read rather devotedly. It's an odd thing, but over the years, I've never heard his name mentioned in any context. Gaston Bachelard. And he wrote about aesthetics and the metaphysics of imagination. For instance, he said that imagination is a tree. Now that's a really good line. I'll put that alongside of Lacan's one-liner. 
the unconscious is structured like a language. So Bachelard said, and again, this is a remark, an observation, a notion, a conceit that you might consider to verge on Gnostic wisdom in some ways, or perhaps not. But I would say to Bachelard, ah, mais bah, dis donc, that's uh, quite a statement. But tell me, sir, if imagination is a tree, then could a tree be an act of imagination? And if it could, then whose imagination would that be? So, yeah, you see, this is why no one talks to me. And uh, I guess it would be appropriate to cast parting glance over my shoulder at another character who figured large and became known due to the adaptation of one of his books to a film, The Name of the Rose, another individual whom you might call an Italian intellectual, if I would dare to uh, coin such a term. That's risky. Umberto Eco. And, of course, Eco does stand, in some respect, in the swamp. He does inhabit the swamp. And you know the signs. The swamp has many signposts stuck in the mud, surrounded by f- flies, no seums, and mosquitoes, which tell you what swamp you're in, you see. Postmodernism, deconstructionism, or is it deconstructivism? I don't know. It's destructivism, that's for sure. And, of course, semiotics. So, Umberto Eco was, like the others, deeply involved in semiotics. You wonder what semiotics is? Well, imagine that you were lost in the wilderness somewhere of northern Canada, and it was very, very cold. And what you had with you was a little survival gear, maybe some woolly socks, but not too much. You really needed to get warm. But fortunately, you had with you a box of matches, wooden matches with little sulfur heads. And just imagine that you were bored being in that wilderness. And the way that you passed your time was by using those matches to pick your nose. That's semiotics. So, having said all that, I invite you to tramp along with me. We're shaking the mud and slime of the swamp off our boots and tramping down the road. And lo and behold, before too long, we come to a lovely little pop stand. And at this pop stand, there are two men. And I detect immediately that they are not French. Very clearly not French. In fact, the sign on the pop stand, which offers some caraway tea as a pick-me-up to weary travelers, Watch out, there's a Nazi illusion there. Um, Are clearly Germans. Because the signs are in German. So the guys are German. And uh, I recognize them immediately because I've had, in my 74 years, more than one occasion to indulge myself in philosophical studies. Franz Brentano, forerunner 
of phenomenology and Edmund Husserl, who more or less established the canon of phenomenology and put it on the map and defined the various terms. Now, these two characters are not easy correspondence in a conversation. In fact, Husserl just basically blubbers on endlessly. But Franz Brentano speaks with the crystal clear lucidity of an Austin. And so he talks about the noema and the noesis, which, by the way, are words that go back to the Greek word nous, which is a fundamental concept in the Gnostic, in the body of Gnostic teachings. Nous, intelligence. So Franz Brentano was a brilliant standalone German philosopher who lived at the end of the 19th century, I believe into the 20th, maybe not. And he, as I said, established the groundwork for phenomenology. Within phenomenology, there are a few, not too many, it's not too complicated, at the level that Brantano constructed it, there are some concepts that resonate extremely closely to Gnostic philosophy, if you want to call it that. For instance, intentionality. Okay? Franz Brentano introduced this concept, which was then developed by Husserl in extremely obtuse and overdetermined language. But intentionality is a factor in a meta narrative. Remember, or I should remember, what it is I'm talking about here. The central topic of this humble little rant. Noesis and noema, intentionality, rather powerful concepts coming or born from the spirit of German intellectualism, which stands in many respects at the summit of the intellectual achievements of the white races in their entirety. Now, when you look back at those bad boys in the swamp, you'll find that they made a very big deal in a rather disingenuous manner about reading texts and analyzing texts, texts and narration. And they made a very big deal about how to deconstruct a text to get to its meaning. They talked about fields of meaning, many other fancy notions like that. But as a matter of fact, they were just playing off something that Husserl said, something that he established as a tool in his discourse on phenomenology, and that was the method of bracketing, or in French, the epoche, bracketing, putting something in brackets, in parentheses. Now that is a valuable tool of what is the word I'm looking for? Not hermeneutics. Well, maybe it is hermeneutics. I'm looking for the word that describes a tool or method that guides interpretation. So I guess you could say, yeah, 
Hermeneutics fits that, more or less. I think there is a better term, however. It escapes me at the moment. So, bracketing is a basic tool in phenomenology, is really all there is to it. And it's a tool that is better handled in the frame of phenomenology than it is in the swamp. Basically, I think those boys in the swamp were trying to recover their intellects from the impact of Dadaism which was largely born in France or in French-speaking Switzerland at the beginning of the 20th century. It's as if they received in their mother's milk a big dose of Dada, and they never got over it, and they were always longing for Dada, and they destroyed their minds in that absurd quest. But there again, I digress. Bear with me while I return to the central topic, the meta-narrative. Intentionality is a property of the meta-narrative. What do you think of that? Obviously, I'm in favor of the meta narrative. I'm not only in favor of it, I'm also favored by it. And I'm here to tell you, as briefly as I can, what you may consider as the ten criteria of a true meta narrative. So here goes. One, it is ongoing. True meta narrative, were you to encounter it, would be like a train that is moving on the track and you have to jump on it when it's moving. Or, to switch the analogy, it's like a film in which you're going to play a role, but you're not invited to the film from the beginning. You're not introduced to the script before they start shooting the film. You're called into the cast. You're called to undertake your role while the film is being shot. That's the first criteria of a true, genuine, viable and livable meta narrative. Two, it has to be based. Based. It has to be based on something that is concrete in cultural and historical terms. Therefore, it has detectable origins which can be identified by evidence. In short, it has proven and provable origins. Criterion 3. It is experimental. That is to say, that within its narrative construction, the plot of the meta-narrative is a construction, obviously, It presents occasions and opportunities to experiment. In that respect, you could say that the meta-narrative is like a laboratory experiment that is set up according to certain guidelines, but those guidelines are flexible, and the parameters of the experiment can be changed and modified as the experiment develops, depending on the successes and failures that occur in that framework. Four, it is transmissible. Now here, the image that may be 
really instructive to see how a meta narrative is transmissible is the murmuration of starlings or a pod of dolphins swimming together, school of fish, monarch butterflies in migration, elephants in migration, slime mold, swarming of bees. There are countless examples from nature of the operation of morphic fields or morphogenetic fields. So, the meta-narrative generates such a morphogenetic field in the way that it is transmissible among those who receive it. And then those who receive it behave as swarming of butterflies, migrations of caribou. They behave according to the natural laws of the natural world, which are actually present in the propagation of the narrative. It is a product of nature just as much as those examples that I cited. Someone who understood this beautifully was, who understood this point beautifully, was Lev Gumilev, wrote about ethnogenesis in the biosphere. And so he considered that the, the morals, the culture, the customs, and the language of any ethnic strain of the human species not only behaved like a biological organism, but it is a biological organism. And the narrative carried by human animals due to their exceptional capacity for language, using language signals and symbols, is the highest conceivable example of that. That is to say of Gumilev's principle of ethnogenesis. Criterion 5. We're at the halfway point. The meta narrative has moral structure. Here again, the analogy could be to the human body. The human body has skin, sense organs, internal organs, a skeletal framework, and consolidating all that giving the animal the power of movement are the ligaments and muscles and sinews of the body. So the moral structure of a narrative can be compared to the ligaments, muscles, and sinews of that narrative, of that story. There are no predefined or authoritatively defined morals to a narrative, to a meta-narrative. It doesn't come with rules of moral obedience. But within its structure, principles of moral behavior naturally emerge. A true meta-narrative is as much an act of nature expressing itself through the human mind, human passion and imagination, as a thunderstorm or an avalanche or a calm day on a small pond in Vermont. Six. The aesthetic component. Now, a true meta narrative that can inspire and guide and uplift, that can provide those to adhere those who adhere to it, 
with a transpersonal objective and a sense of living transpersonally as well as personally. The one does not exclude the other. True narrative that can do that is a loaded with aesthetics everywhere you look. Up and down, right and left. Just chock full of aesthetic values, insights, and above and beyond all else, the throbbing sense of beauty. Beauty drives the meta narrative as a kind of combustion fuel or something like ATP, adenosine triphosphate, manufactured in the ribosomes of cells. Seven. Now, here's a criterion unique among the ten that is best stated by negation. True meta narrative displays a remarkable lack of metaphysics. It doesn't need scaffolding. And metaphysics is nothing but scaffolding, theodicy, apologies for God, yada, 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 and yana, 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 the whole nine yards of Buddhist metaphysics, for instance, is totally disposable and totally dispensable and extraneous for a genuine meta-narrative. There can be some small component of metaphysics in a meta-narrative, but it has to be something like a perfect little crystalline deposit, a perfect little vein of precious ore, not a great scaffolding, not cathedrals and cathedrals and, and synagogues and mausoleums of metaphysics. Nope. Criterion number eight, it supports ideology. It does support a specific ideology. Now, ideology is ideology. It is not narrative. You can say, for instance, that Moby Dick by Herman Melville is a narrative but it's not an ideology. An ideology is a very particular form of language through which different races express their self-identity. Now, this is a rather peculiar criterion of the ten because it requires that there arise within that people, that ethnos, or super-ethnos, to use Gumilev's terms, that there arise within that particular racial strain, and remember here we're talking about the white races, the collectivity or spectrum of the white races, this criterion requires that there arise within those races leaders and exemplars who give definition to the ideology for the people who live the narrative born out of their racial imagination. Got that? So it's rather a special instance, a meta-narrative, a complete, genuine, 
full-blown, magnificent, fruitful, generative meta-narrative would require in the world where it exists leaders, exemplars, those who define the ideology that is compatible to the meta narrative and that in fact grows naturally out of it in the form of tendrils, as if you saw tendrils of a plant, climbing plant, tendrils of ivy growing out of a log. That's ideology. And on every one of the leaves of that climbing plant, is the identity of a particular individual represents the mission defined by that particular race or itself. Coming to criterion number nine, we have a rather elaborate component, inclusion, of the normal and the paranormal. There is no normal in a genuine guiding meta-narrative without consideration of the paranormal, without the admission of what the paranormal actually is. The paranormal dimension of nature, the paranormal operations of the human psyche But the inverse is also true. There is no paranormal without the normal. Think about that. In the Gnostic meta-narrative, which is called the fallen goddess scenario, the factor of the paranormal is lavishly obvious. Not only that, But that narrative could not have been developed had not its authors, who were visionary seers, been able to access paranormal states, which they did in their practice of shamanism. So the perception, the direct perception of the paranormal and the supernatural belongs in a meta-narrative. It's part of the construction. But it does not contradict the normal. The normal needs the paranormal. And the paranormal needs the normal. You know, there's an old meme going back to Terence McKenna. I guess it would be in the 70s or maybe early 80s where Terence, you know, famously said, well, A shaman is just someone in a culture who has the permission of the culture to go outside of it into the realm of the sacred. So you have the dichotomy of sacred and profane, paranormal and normal, sacred and mundane, paranormal and normal. And Terence said that the shaman has the permission to go outside of the boundaries of the normal, of the culture, and return and be respected for doing so. The possibility for that to occur in any culture or racial strain must be inherent to the meta narrative of that strain. Finally, I bet you thought we'd never get here, we come to the tenth criterion, which is, drumroll please, intentionality. Remember, I brought that item up when we were tramping away from the swamp, and we came across the pop stand run by Franz Brentano, intentionality. Fancy word, but you could say 
intention, purpose, telos. The Gnostics called themselves telestai, which simply means those who have purpose, those who are aimed, those who intend and are intended. So, the meta narrative has intention. It has a name and an objective toward which it moves, grows, develops, propagates. And everyone who adheres to that meta narrative, who voluntarily logs onto it and lives it out, finds within himself or herself the growing strength of intentionality. It comes from being in the narrative. The narrative confers the sense of purpose. That intentionality, I must emphasize, is transpersonal. But have you ever run across anyone, or maybe you yourself? Who knows? I certainly don't have a clue. But have you ever run across anyone who... This came out and said, well, you know, I just don't feel like I can fulfill my life unless I have a transpersonal perspective and a transpersonal aim. Has that ever happened to you? The intentionality of the meta narrative provides that element to the individual human person. The transpersonal fulfills the personal. Personal cannot fulfill itself. So there you have it. That's pretty much the last note of this little talk. And wrapping it up, I invite you to return to my opening ploy. I refer to the madness in the world today, the insane behavior being enacted due to the cruelest treachery that was ever perpetrated on the human race on such a scale. And I mentioned the Soviet totalitarian nightmare. Well, that's an historical allusion, obviously. There was a time in the 20th century when the Soviet totalitarian nightmare was raging. Read Solzhenitsyn. And today, it may well be that what you are seeing, if you can look with clear and sober eyes, and if you've got the guts to handle it, is a further and final iteration of the Soviet totalitarian nightmare. Do you want to know how powerful a meta narrative can be? Well, Ask yourself this question. Is there a meta narrative driving the Soviet totalitarian nightmare that currently seeks to devour the world? Is there a meta narrative behind COVID 19 working through? that deceit, what do you say? And if you say, yeah, yeah, yes, there is, then tell me exactly, if you please, which meta narrative, what sort and what manner of meta narrative might that be?